You know what? I'm not ashamed to admit it. Back when I was a kid, I thought Fatal Attraction was one comic book. The whole storyline was one comic book. And that was X-Men number 25 with Wolverine and Magneto on the cover. I didn't know. It just looked cool. I asked my mom to get it and she got it for me. I didn't know that it expanded, you know, six different books and it expanded just about every X title they had in the 90s. I didn't know that. But we're going to rectify that now because we're going to cover the whole Fatal Attraction series, starting with X Factor number 92. So on the first page, you see the Acolytes attacking this hospice hospital. Now, the Acolytes are like the blind followers of Magneto, who in this point in X-Men's history is assumed dead. So the nurse is telling the story about what happened, and she first starts off by explaining how she's been working at hospice for a long time, and when the patients go there and like they pass away in their sleep, there's like a peacefulness and a happiness and a dignity to it. But as soon as you turn the page, all that happiness is gone. You see patients flying in the air. There's one mutant that's grabbing somebody's IV, like drip. I don't know what they're doing to it, but pretty much it's going to turn them into a hashtag soon. I mean, it's crazy. But the nurse that's telling the story is actually being attacked by this mutant named Sinyaka. He has like these energy whips and he's choking her out. And as soon as you turn the page, you see how bad she got burned by the energy whips on her neck and her face and her head. I mean, it's gruesome. So the nurse is telling the story to Alex Summer, who is the brother of Scott Summer, but he's also the leader of X Factor. Valerie Cooper, who is like the government liaison because X Factor at this time is government ran. And Pietro, who is the son of Magneto at this time, but we know later on that's going to change. So as they're leaving, the nurse stops Quicksilver and asks him, what kind of man can this Magneto be to inspire such insanity? And as Quicksilver is answering her question, she flatlines. So as soon as you turn the page, you see that scanner was actually snooping in on the conversation. She flies back and goes to inform uh, Fabian Cortez about what's going on. You can tell she's probably there. She really doesn't want to be there because Fabian Cortez is pretty much treating her like trash. It's pretty crazy. So then we cut where X Factors headquarters is you got havoc you got multiple man you got strong guy you got polaris you got wolfsbane obviously valerie cooper and they capture spore who is one of the acolytes and he's sticking to the gco he's pretty much like i ain't saying nothing and you ain't getting nothing out of me and you know you know he's sticking to it but then quicksilver walks in and he just turns into a little punk like it's the son of the messiah and then he starts worshiping him and all this other kind of other stuff it's it was weird so now that he went from sticking to the g code to being a resident of the snitch city i mean he might as well put some rainbow highlights in his fur so now x factor knows that the next attack is going to be on cap hayden but valley cooper is acting like weird like she's used to boss him around but she's acting like extra weird and she pretty much tell x factor stay back she grabs pedro and random who is not really a part of x factor she's more like valerie cooper's backup this that's a weird relationship and they had a campaign so obviously x factor's not going to hang back and they decide to follow valerie in this new ship that Ford's built for him um, that's designed for polaris to pilot using her mutant powers but if you know anything about polaris back then she wasn't like the greatest with it her confidence level wasn't as high as it is like i guess now and uh so they're being tossed around a little bit and strong guys like he's going to be sick and then she has to stop the ship suddenly strong guy throws up because they run into exorcist so i'm thinking to myself well that's a wrap <laughs> i mean they'll be lucky to live this experience let alone beat this guy and keep following because exorcist is a beast but he kind of just looks at him seems like he wants to say something but then he doesn't and it just kind of flies off so they continue to follow uh valerie to camp hayden so now valerie pedro and random make it to camp hayden and obviously they're met with resistance and pedro just runs around and takes all the soldiers guns like what are you gonna do and then all of a sudden robert kelly senator robert kelly pops up out of nowhere so senator kelly's like you know you're not authorized to be here what are you doing here you need to leave the premises and valerie cooper's like pulling rank on him. like pretty much we're doing an investigation and you need to get out of the way because you know we need to investigate the base and as they're walking she's explaining project wide awake so one of the original ogs to this youtube comic book stuff 
is Rob from Comics Explained, and he breaks down Project Wide Awake a lot better than what I can ever break down. So definitely uh, go check out his channel and check out the video if you want to know more. Uh, the short and skinny of it is Project Wide Awake is like a government agency. Well, government officials pretty much came together uh, to talk about the mutant problem. Senator Robert Kelly is the one who is spearheading it at this time when the comic book's going on. And um, Boulevard Trash is the one who pretty much made the Sentinel program. And what you see here is the second generation of Sentinels. Now, unfortunately for Valerie Cooper, X Factor has caught up and they heard everything. And they are pissed. I mean, it looks like they're about to start beating her up only thing that kind of saves her is the acolytes show up so now they all break off into like individual fights and i'm not going to get into all of them you know if you want to check out the comic book to see check out all the details that's fine but i will get into my favorite one and that was jamie madrox multi-man so he's fighting this guy seamus mellencamp he looks like this reptile type of mutant he has really sharp claws and really sharp teeth and this dude is like running through all of his like duplicates and he feels like he has the main guy the main jamie madrox and he's even talking to him talking about you know before i kill you uh, i'm gonna hurt you real bad and he sticks his fingers he sticks his thumbs into his eyes and he blinds him and <laughs> like it's gruesome he's bleeding everywhere and jamie's like I, I hate to do this and the duplicate that got blinded sticks his hand into Seamus's mouth and he duplicates himself and then the original Jamie's like all the way on the other side and he's like you you made me do this and the clones like it's easy for you to say I mean it was it was nuts it was like the best part of the comic so then the second coolest part of this comic was when uh, Fabian Cortez is trying to convince Pedro to come back to the Acolytes and lead them. And, you know, Pedro, I meant to say Pietro, I apologize. So it's like just standing there, right? And Fabian Cortez, like, you know, you're not even trying to help. He's like, little do you know, you know, I've been saving everybody that I can. I'm just moving so fast. It just seems like I'm standing still. I was like, oh, that was raw. So X Factor is winning all their individual fights and then Scanner pretty much gets all the acolytes out of there. So it seems like X Factor won the day, but then they turn around and the Sentinels are gone. They don't know if the acolytes took them or if Senator Robert Kelly took them. They don't know where the hell they're at. And then Valerie Cooper starts to cough up this green thing that falls out of her mouth. A few issues ago, she got kidnapped by the Acolytes and I guess they implanted this in her and this is why she was acting all crazy. Cause now she's all being remorseful and saying, you know, please forgive me. And X Factor is not trying to hear it and everybody's pretty much walking away from her. And that's how the comic book ends. Now we're covering X-Force number 25. So it we'll starts off with this shadowy figure looking at this computer screen with all these different mutants on the screen and it looks like they're mutants from all the different x teams x-men x-force x-caliber x-factor and also on this page they got something extremely useful they got the complete roster of x-force you got cannonball who's the leader you got boomer feral warpath richter shatterstar siren and sunspot now for all you old heads like me i know what you're thinking right now where's cable we're going to get to that. So now X-Force just got back from a mission and they're talking about how two of their comrades have been brainwashed by Strife. Now, if you don't know who that is, we'll get into it later on in the comics. And again, you see this shadowy figure looking on them. Now, for our yo heads, we know who this is. And then there's a uh, detection of an intruder. So they decide to break up into teams of two to go deal with the intruder. And the intruder just starts taking them out. First, he took out Warpath and Siren. Next, he took out uh, Richter and Sunspot. Then he took out Feral and Shatterstar. But then Sam, Cannonball, gets a jump on him. And he drops his gun. And then as soon as Cannonball sees the gun and he sees what's written on it, which is Ouchmaker, he knows obviously who this is and it's Cable. Now, some people are happy to see him like Boomer. And then some people like Sunspot wish he stayed gone. Sam's kind of in the middle. Sam kind of really doesn't know whether he's happy to see him or he's ready to see him gone. 
Uh, but Cable starts to explain himself how he, when he first formed the team, he trained them in like a really cold military fashion, how he didn't really befriend them. Uh, he didn't trust them with anything, didn't tell them about his past or anything like that. Uh, but he said he learned this lesson and he's going to change. And it seems like the team is start to accept them back so a little bit of time passes by and the team is discussing about what they need to do about rusty and skids now rusty and skid were on the run from freedom force now i uh, know most of you are probably saying what is freedom force all right so x factor is x-men that are pretty much ran by the government freedom force is the exact opposite they're the brotherhood of evil mutants that are ran by the government as long as they follow the government orders they will be pardoned for all the craziness that they did in the past and to get away from freedom force they join the mutant liberation front which was ran by strife who is a zach clone of cable and since we're on the subject let me take this opportunity to try to finally put some respect on cable's name so to give a quick rundown on strife's powers he has superhuman strength and he has durability but he mostly uses his telekinesis and his telepathy and it's omega level i mean he's on the same level as gene gray and frost exodus i mean he's a beast certified put a stamp on it and the only reason why Cable's not on the same level is because when he was a baby, Apocalypse affected him with the techno-organic virus and he has to use most of his power to keep that at bay. That's why he's half machine. And all it takes is one writer to come up with a cure for a techno-organic virus and now Cable's Omega level. I mean, we kind of saw that with Days of Apocalypse. X-Man is pretty much Cable without the techno-organic virus and he was mutant Jesus. Thank you for letting me go on a rant. Now back to the comic. So when they join the Mutant Liberation Front, Strife pretty much put a device in their head to brainwash them and mind control them. And they don't know how to get that out of their head. Cable knows how he doesn't have the technology in this timeline to do it. So Sam is still having some trust issues with Cable. And Cable pretty much lays everything out for him. I mean, if you didn't know anything about Cable, this was a comic book to pick up. He says how his name is Nathan Dayspring's. He says how he is the son of Cyclops and Madeline Pryor, who is the exact clone of Jean Grey. He says how this mutant woman, Ascani, took him a thousand years into the future. He explains how he got infected with the techno organic virus. He also explains how strife is as that clone of him and how he came to this timeline to try to prevent the war that they lost in the future so as soon as he explains all that the alarms go off there's an intruder on the base so they go to find out who it is and it is exorcist and he just starts beating everybody down like i said before he's gonna make a level mutant so then after he thoroughly beat everybody down he goes oh i didn't really come to fight and i'm thinking to myself i'm like i couldn't tell and he's there because he wants to recruit sam and sunspot because they used to be on the new mutants and sam's like okay we'll go with you but we'll go only if we can also take boomer and richter and x is like well they weren't really requested but whatever then end this come on let's go so the exodus takes them to the space station that's called avalon and sam and them as soon as they get there they know they're like this is gray malkin which gray malkin is the time traveling spaceship that cable used to come back to this timeline and they're like well why are you calling the avalon and exodus is like because the messiah is calling the avalon now for all you old school x-men fans we know there's only one person that was called the messiah oh and i also forgot to mention that exodus also took rusty and skits so then right on cue a cloak figure appears and he starts explaining how they are a part of his chosen few that's going to survive the oncoming destruction that's about to happen to the earth and humanity and how mutants will be protected but not all mutants will be protected so then he turns to rusty and skid and he explains how he knows what strife did to him and he can heal them and he puts his hands on her head and he goes uh, the iron flow in your blood is blocked who else talks like that and then he does some things and then boom the mind control device is gone and they're cured 
So then Cable and the rest of X-Force obviously follow them to Avalon. And as soon as they get up there, he sees that it's his old ship. And he's shocked because last time he seen that ship, it was crashing into the Pacific Ocean. So obviously the Messiah knows that they're coming. And he tells Exorcist to pretty much take care of business and he just walks off. So the fight's going a little bit better this time for X-Force. They're getting some hits in, but this is Exodus, so they're still losing. But it wasn't Cable's intention to beat Exodus. He knows he couldn't beat Exodus. He was just trying to buy enough time to get to the professor who is the AI of the ship. And he sets it up to where the whole team gets body slide out of there. And that's pretty much means they get teleported out of the ship. Uh, everybody is up for Rusty and Skid because Rusty and Skid said they want to stay. So then Cable also stays because he's trying to figure out a way to take the AI with him. And so the Nexus is about to handle him and then all of a sudden all you hear his voice says, no, I got this. And Magneto in full garb shows up, which I mean, obviously there was enough clues to show that it was Magneto. So they get to fighting and it's going exactly how you think it would go. I mean, Magneto's pretty much mopping the floor with Cable. But uh, Cable does manage to download AI and then right when he's about to take off, Magneto just goes, you know, I've always been your fatal attraction and you're going to pay for taking away my children away from me. And he just turns his metal side, the Technorganic virus side inside out i mean he's he's just decimated just all the pieces are pretty much showing it's it's gruesome so then magneto is still talking to him and cable goes to say something is faint and then magneto turns to him and was like how are you still alive so before he got decimated he was able to set it up to where uh, the ai would bite slide him out of there and he gets teleported to the X-Force ship and they look at him and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> if he's still alive, we gotta go straight to the medical bay. So the comic book ends with Magneto talking to Exodus and Rusty and Skid, pretty much saying that they ain't playing no more games. They're about to start taking people out. Just like DX would say, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we are about to get into the Uncanny X-Men number 304. So it starts off with Mr. Fabian Cortez getting attacked by his own acolyte. So if you don't know why this is happening, it's not a long story, but it is a story. So Fabian Cortez was born to a rich, wealthy family, and he joined a group called the Upstarts, which was a group of mutants who used to go out and kill other mutants for points it was led by game master so fabian got the bright idea to go ahead and go after the biggest baddest mutant there is to win the game and that would be magneto so he got together a group of mutants who believed in magneto's teachings and he named them the acolytes and then he went to magneto so using his charm he quickly gained the trust of magneto and then on asteroid m he set out to do what he came there to do to win the game and he seemingly killed magneto by betraying him. so now he's like Beyonce he's feeling himself so then he goes out and he kidnaps Myra McTaggart but then the X-Men go pretty much beat him up freeze Myra and arrest him and acolytes while in prison by the X-Men he finds out that Magneto did not die so he figures out a way to escape and then he gets the bright idea to try to recruit Quicksilver who is Magneto's son at the time to try to sway the acolytes to his side I say he was rich, not smart. But you can watch the video on that one because we covered it in our playlist that was X Factor number 92. And now Magneto has a new right hand man, which is Exorcist, and he's there to pick up the acolytes and to deal with Fabian. And now you know why Fabian is screaming like a little bitch. So then on the next page, you see Fabian uses mutant power to try to get the acolytes off of him. He's trying to explain himself. And on the next page, Exodus is pretty much breaking down the exact betrayal of Fabian Cortez on Magneto and pretty much are having none of it. So then on the next page, Fabian's back into a corner and he decides to attack Exodus, which was a bad idea. Exodus pretty much uses mutant power and fries Fabian Cortez with Chris, but does not kill him because Magneto said not to. But on the next page, we see Charles Xavier 
pretty much getting ready for the funeral of Ileana Rasputin. Now, that is the little sister of Colossus. Her code name is Magic. She was the first victim of the Legacy Virus. For those of you who don't know what the Legacy Virus is, don't worry, I'll be making a video breaking it all down. If I get into all the nuances of the Legacy Virus, this is going to be a video that is way too long. Let's just say it was a virus made by Strife, who was a clone of Cable, and it was a virus only to kill mutants but it mutated ironically and it started killing normal humans too so then we see Lalandra, the queen of the shiar empire and the lover of charles xavier use shiar technology to send an astral presence of herself to talk to charles to try to comfort him because he's going through it as he blames himself for what happened to eliana so then on the next few pages we see the leaders of the world pretty much get together to enact the magneto protocols i know you're sitting there probably asking yourself what the hell the magneto protocols trust me you're about to see so then it cuts to magneto who's on avalon and he's looking down on earth now if you're wondering what avalon is go ahead click the link on the playlist you'll be able to catch up on the next few pages he's pretty much thinking to himself the things that he went through which pretty much shaped him and molded him into becoming magneto because his name is eric lyncher he is a jewish survivor of the holocaust he married another holocaust survivor her name was magna and they started a family and they had a daughter named anya to try to make a long story short where he was living was just as corrupt as the german you know what that he just left he comes home to see his house is on fire he was able to rescue his wife but when he went in and tried to save his daughter his employer along with the police rushed him and beat him down and prevented him from rescuing her and she died so at that exact moment his powers manifest and he kills everybody there except for his wife but he scared her so much that she's now terrified of him and she left him now we see soldiers have been called in to try to deal with him but this is magneto he deals with them and that is the tragic backstory of magneto so then it cuts to kitty pride and storm they're in the mansion and kitty has i guess been away for a little bit and she's kind of down for the things that happened to iliana and she pretty much is saying she just wants to be normal storm being a strong person that she is is explaining to her that it doesn't matter all the things that happen you can't bring yourself down you just pretty much got to keep moving forward and be proud that you're a mutant so while storm is using her mutant powers to fly around kitty in the sky like she used to they look down to see colossus is burning all of his paintings so kitty tries to talk some sense into colossus but he just lost his little sister he doesn't know really what to do and he pretty much just walks away so then it cuts to bishop and banshee who is pretty much trying to get the church ready for the funeral and they're having a conversation about how everything is going bad bishop is from the future just like cable is he comes from a dystopian future he went back in time to try to prevent it and he's explained to banshee that banshee will eventually turn into this type of person banshee doesn't want to hear it he's like you know what don't even tell me about it so then we get to the funeral storm is saying some nice words about liana and then we see that professor xavier is trying to talk to colossus the colossus having none of it he lost his sister he blames charles he doesn't know what to do he's lost and he's just had enough so right at that exact moment magneto shows up now the acolytes are there but they're pretty much not needed it's just is Magneto and Exodus and they are handling all of the X-Men they're like the Legion of Doom or the Road Warriors back in the 80s and 90s I know I'm old and it's like Magneto is tapped into like his Super Saiyan powers not only is he got most of the X-Men frozen in place by controlling the iron flow in their bloodstream but he also dismantles Charles Xavier's wheelchair and Simultaneously, he's bringing down the space station in Avalon, which if he brings it down with enough force, <laughs> that's pretty much like a meteor hitting the planet, which would cause all this dirt and dust to go up to the atmosphere. It'll be stuck there for like a year and it'll cause another ice age. And we know how the dinosaurs handle that, right? So then on the next page, you have Pietro Quicksilver. He starts talking shit to Magneto talking about how his acolytes attacked a hospice hospital back in x factor number 92 which we covered as part of the playlist and how a certain mutant senyaka uh, actually tortured this nurse and she wound up dying of her injury so i guess those 
cables that he use are metal because Magneto was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And he just wraps Sinaka in the cables and pretty much burns them and kills them right on the spot. So I guess he burned them pretty bad because Jubilee looks like she's about to throw up just looking at him. And then like I said before, he's doing all this and he's simultaneously bringing down the space station like he shows them they find the space station finally makes it through the clouds so now the x-men can see the space station coming at them so everything is going magneto's way except for just one little hiccup bishop his mute power is he can absorb energy kinetic energy or otherwise and then he can redirect that energy so he's like black panther suit pretty much in a nutshell so he pretty much redirects that energy right at magneto and it was enough so that magneto will release his hold on the x-men so now that rogue is free she tries to absorb magneto's powers by kissing him because you know, that's what she does and typically this will work but magneto's so charged up she pretty much kissed him and it pretty much did nothing he just swats her away so then he takes the metal fence that's going around a church and he just starts wrapping up the X-Men in it. Everybody except for Bishop. Bishop, again, absorbed all his energy and he's trying to re-release it back on Magneto. But that's when we see Colossus pretty much portrays the X-Men and he attacks Bishop and gets Bishop off of Magneto. And then he tells Magneto that he wants to join his acolytes. So while all that's going on, Storm and Jean are trying to work together to hold up Avalon so it doesn't crash into the earth. I know there's a lot of action going on, but this was like your typical X-Men comic book back in the 90s. So now Magneto and Professor Xavier is about to have like this ultimate standoff. And this is the only part of the comic book where I kind of question it a little bit. So Professor Xavier pretty much tells Magneto that he's always underestimated him and he like grabs him and his eyes turn red and i don't know if he is like using his powers like against him or if he's using telekinesis which i'll explain why i have an issue with that but he pretty much takes magneto he goes up they both go up into the atmosphere and he sends magneto into asteroid m and the whole asteroid plus magneto goes back into space so professor xavier's powers and abilities he has a genius level intellect which a lot of people in marvel comics have a genius level intellect like every fifth character is a genius but his psychic abilities are extremely powerful he has esp he has telepathy and he has mental manipulation now it states that he has telekinesis via x headgear does you see any headgear on him because i ain't seen any headgear on him but that looks like telekinesis to me i'm just saying so the book ends with professor xavier falling back down to earth and archangel going up to catch him and to bring him back down to the x-men all right scm nation i want to know What's the comic that did it for you? I'm not talking like that. Get your mind out the gutter. This is a family friendly channel for the most part. I'm talking about the one that solidified your fandom. And I'm not necessarily talking about the very first comic you read. I'm talking about the one that made you say, holy shit, what just happened? Or holy shit, that was fantastic. Please let me know in the comments. The one that did it for me, it's X-Men number 25, and we're about to get into it. But the world took notice. That's why you see the President of the United States talking to Nick Fury, so you know it's serious. The Cold War is over, so the President of the United States is talking to the Russian President, and they have what's called the Magneto Protocols. We are definitely about to get into what that is. So they send it over to Nick Fury and Nick Fury goes to Forge because I guess Forge is the one who built this. And Nick Fury is like, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> and Forge is like, well, there's one way to find out. And he pushes the button. And all these satellites that are around the world start to charge up and start sending this laser beam all around the world. And it covers it. Pretty much what it does, it disrupts the EM field of the Earth so that if Magneto comes back down the Earth, his power are negated greatly and let me just say get off track for a little bit i used to get in an argument all the time with people back in the 90s where i will always try to say like magneto is the biggest bad guy there is and people you say oh well what about dr doom okay for one thing i do love dr doom and he messed with the whole world but it never got to the point to where the world says 
we're going to set up something to where he does not come back that's how much magneto scared the world they don't want him to come back so you know magneto's having none of this and he is such in tune with his powers that he can go out into space without a spacesuit and it's just fine so he goes down into the em field in the comic book they said he said a prayer to a god he no longer believes in which was deep and then he takes it out by creating a huge emp that decimates the earth so first they show the fantastic four and the thing is coming out of the bathtub yelling at reed richards thinking he did something and uh <laughs> he was like why you always gotta do something when i'm taking a bubble bath and i'm thinking to myself a bubble bath but are you really gonna talk to a six foot seven 500 pound rock monster smoking on a cigar I don't think so. And Reed is telling Ben that it was a pulse wave that he'd never felt before. I mean, it was that powerful. Then they cut to California and the pulse waves devastating there. Uh, they cut to Japan and they show some fire flying and it knocks him out of the sky. They go to England where uh, they show Nightcrawler and Captain Britain drinking tea and next thing you know, everything goes black. I mean, the only people that are not affected are the X-Men and the only reason why they're not affected is because they have Shi'ar technology. So this one act took planes out the sky, knocked off life support machines and hospitals completely out. I mean, messed with traffic lights so there's probably thousands of accidents. I mean, Magneto is responsible for thousands upon thousands of deaths with this one act. Now Charles Xavier is a very patient man, but everybody everybody has a breaking point and he knows what time it is he knows that humanity is not just going to blame magneto for this they're going to blame all of mutant kind every mute is going to catch hell for this he knows it and he also knows that he needs to do something about it so he goes up to his x-men and he's pretty much like we gotta roll up on magneto but we ain't gonna roll like we normally do like deep as hell now we gonna roll with a small team a six it's him and Gene, it's Wolverine, and it's Gambit, and it's Quicksilver and Rogue. Now, why would you send Wolverine in to deal with the Master of Magnetism? Just think about the very first X-Men movie. You must be Wolverine. Remarkable metal doesn't run through your entire body, does it? He has owned Wolverine throughout his publication. <laughs> As good old JR would say, he whoops him like a government mule every time. Now, he has Gene there because it takes a lot of his power just to power that suit so his mental capacity ain't what it would normally be if he just went up there and you know rocked the wheelchair but in saying that gene is questioning everything he does and there's a reason for that because professor xavier is not in his right mind now it's not just gene questioning professor xavier almost everybody is questioning professor xavier because the way he sounds and the way he's acting, he's acting and sounding like he's about to do something that he thought he would never in life do, but it has come to that point where he's willing to do it. So now the team flies up to Avalon and they get into the space station and they get in with very little resistance. And the reason being is because Colossus, the man who turned his back on the X-Men, who wants nothing to do with Xavier because he blames him for his sister's death, also saw what Magneto did. And when it's all said and done, Colossus is a good person and he just can't condone that many people dying at somebody's hands. So at this moment, he siding with Xavier. So the only real resistance they run into is Rusty and Skid. Now, if you wonder why Rusty and Skid's there, if you even know who Rusty and Skid's are, it's really not important, but 
that was in X Force number 25, which we covered. All you gotta do is go to the playlist. But they're pretty much saying how Magneto's helped him, which he did, because Strife had him under mind control and Magneto freed him under mind control. And Gene is trying to talk to him, you know, like they normally do. And Professor Xavier just goes and like, we ain't got time for this, children. Wow, let's put some sleep. Mental KO. I mean, typically, Professor Xavier is trying to do all he can to try to find a peaceful resolution to any situation. So this this shows how fed up he is and also too how far gone he is when it comes to this. So if you go back to X-Force number 25, Avalon is Cable's ship. That's the ship that they're in right now. Magneto took it from him. So it has all kinds of crazy futuristic technology including body slide. That's what Cable did to get his team up out of there before Magneto handled him and he handled Cable. It was ugly. But Professor Xavier knows about this technology so he got with Colossus and he was able to body slide or teleport all the acolytes up out of there, especially Exus. He didn't want nothing to do with Exus. He wanted nothing to do with him. So he made sure that Exus was off the table before he had to go deal with Magneto. So now it's just Magneto and the X-Men. So they get to fighting. Wolverine jumps at Magneto. He just swats him away because again, why would you send somebody with metal claws or metal skeleton to fight the master of magnetism? So the reason why the other X-Men are there is they're gonna try to get Magneto's helmet off. His helmet blocks any kind of mental manipulation that Gene or Professor Xavier can do. So they're trying to do whatever they can to try to knock off his helmet. Gambit throws his playing cards. Magneto pretty much takes up some metal shard, hits him right in the mouth, just takes him right out. Now, Rogue distracts Magneto just enough so that Quicksilver came and he knocked off his helmet. So Magneto is sitting there and he's like, Dude, I got the world against me. I got the X-Men against me. And now I got my own son against me. And he's just tired. And he's about to handle Quicksilver. I mean, he's he's about to do what he did to him on House of M like 10 years early. But then Wolverine comes out of nowhere and he gets Magneto. I mean, he gets him really good. And Magneto is hurt. And Magneto is pretty much done. Now, to his credit, he says, you know, we've been doing this song and dance for a long time, Wolverine, and you are my most visceral enemy, but also one of my most respected foes, because Wolverine understands what time it is with Magneto, but he's never scared and he never backs down from him, and Magneto respects that, but right now, it's over. And he reaches in and he just starts pulling out his animidium out of all parts of his body. It is ridiculously gruesome and horrifying. Now, just like Magneto just lost it, Professor Xavier just loses it. And he is done playing with Magneto. His helmet is off. He picks up Magneto and he's like, I'm done playing these games. Just like you just ended Wolverine, I'm about to end you. And he reaches into his mind and he shuts him down, takes out everything out of Magneto's mind, takes it into himself and turns Magneto into a vegetable. And I know before you guys go into the comments and be like, he's not really a vegetable, he's just in a vegetative state. Don't play with me. So Jean is trying to hold Wolverine together with her mental powers. Professor Xavier has pretty much passed out from the whole experience and Rogue got him and Colossus comes out and picks up Magneto and the team's like, you coming with us? He's like, somebody gotta be here to take care of him and I'm gonna do that. And that is how the comic book ends. So many things change for the X-Men because of the things that happened in this comic book. So many things change in the Marvel Universe because of the things that happened in this comic book. It's one of my favorite comic books ever. And if you never read it before, I'm happy to bring it to you for the first time. This book goes into so many directions. It is not funny, but it's towards the end that makes this book so iconic when you bring up wolverine number 75 and they go oh yeah that's when that's what we're going to get to 
My name is Dorian, this is SEO Comics, and we're covering the complete Fatal Attraction series. So the book starts off with Bishop flying a blackbird up to Avalon to pick up everybody. And come to find out, the blackbird is not designed for space travel, so he's having all kinds of issues trying to get it back to Earth. And while that's going on, you have Wolverine that's going in and out of dream states because he's about that close to death. So you might as well say his life is flashing before his eyes. And this dream state starts off with his best friend, Victor Creed, AKA Sabretooth, pretty much slashing the hell out of him. And he's in his Weapon X outfit. And that's how he got his aluminum in the first place. And then on the very next page, he's having a flashback to the last comic book where Magneto ripped out all the aluminum out of his body and tried to put him on a t-shirt. And while all that's going on, you got Professor Xavier trying to talk Jean Grey into helping him to keep Wolverine from slipping too far into that dream state because death is definitely on the other side. So they're also going through all these flashbacks that Wolverine's having. Like right now he's having a flashback of the Weapon X program and he's actually in the tank when they're about to inject them with the aluminium. But like I said before, they're in a plane that's not designed for space travel. So Bishop and Pedro do the best they can, but let's just say there is a lot of turbulence. And even though he's in these dream states there's occasions where he actually wakes up <laughs> because again wolverine is definitely He's so you can see on the next page how his healing factor is trying to do its normal thing and it almost gets there but it got pushed to the limit with all that aluminium getting pulled out of it and it's not quite doing the job that it normally does. So Meyer McTaggart is on the radio trying to give medical advice so that wolverine <laughs> doesn't die up there and Jubilee is in the background freaking out to the point to where Myra McTaggart has to tell her, look, <laughs> either calm your butt down or go somewhere else because right now what you're doing is not helping. So they are in Earth atmosphere now, but they are coming in hot <laughs> to the point to where they don't know if they're going to be able to land this thing. So while that's going on, Wolverine goes into another dream state where he's fighting as Weapon X again. And then again, they show Magneto show up and he just rips <laughs> Wolverine's skeleton right out of his body. And now he's like this skin bag. Literally, he's a, like a skin bag. And Professor Xavier is trying to like hold him because now he knows that he, he's about to cross over. So on the next page, we see this angel comes down and it's Ileana Rasmutant, which is the sister of Colossus. She's the one who died of the legacy virus. That's the funeral that Magneto interrupted in Uncanny X-Men 304. So Wolverine at this point is ready. He's done fighting. He's ready to cross over. And, you know, he's talking to her and he's like, I'm ready to go, darling. And next thing you know, she pushes him away. While that's going on, Jean Grey gets jostled and she goes flying out one of the bay doors and she's barely hanging on i'm thinking to myself it's okay just let go because you can fly but you know what we're just going to leave common sense out of this we're just going to go with this so everybody's freaking out nobody can get to her in time she eventually lets go and then you see this hand come out of nowhere and it's wolverine He's the one that actually saves her. So they get the plane under control and then the comic book jumps to two weeks later. My armor tagger is trying to keep Wolverine out of the danger room. He's trying to go in there. She's like, look, <laughs> your healing factor has been stressed to its limit. You don't have aluminum on your bones no more. We don't know what kind of horrific injuries you could get inflicted. If you go in there, you can't go in. Wolverine pretty much moves her hand out the way. It's like, look, I need to get back to doing what I do best. Get out my way. So he goes in there and he's kind of timid he's moving around he's not really striking back and people can see like he's not his normal self to where he normally is just is slashing and killing as many things as he can so finally he gets hit to the point to where he's about to do his thing and this is my favorite part of the comic book this is like one of my favorite moments in comics period so like i said before he gets hit and now he's pissed and anytime he's pissed what does he do he pops his claws but he doesn't have any claws because he got his aluminium ripped out. Nope, not true. He pops those things and they pop out and everybody's freaking out like, oh my God, <laughs> he has bone claws. He didn't even know he had bone claws and he's just screaming as he's just bleeding everywhere. I love that page. That page is deep. 
So now more time has passed. Wolverine and Jubilee are sitting outside the mansion and they're just talking about life and he pops the claws again. And Jubilee's like, should you be doing that? He was like, well, I gotta keep the channels open. And she goes, well, doesn't it hurt? And he goes, every single time, again. He's tapered a $2 steak, no doubt about it. So the comic pretty much ends with him writing a letter to Jubilee saying how he needs to kind of go on his own to try to figure himself out. And, you know, she wakes up and she sees him riding off on his motorcycle on into the sunset and it gets kind of crazy for Wolverine after this. I think to myself, like, what more can be covered in the series? Cable got turned inside out by Magneto. Wolverine got his aluminium ripped out by Magneto. Professor Xavier went in Magneto's mind and shut it down, turned him into a vegetable. Wolverine found out he has bone claws and he left the team. What more can we cover in this series? Oh, that's right. There was Uncanny X-Men 304, where Colossus joined the Acolytes. We're about to take care of that today. My name is Dorian, this is SEM Comics, and we are covering the last part of the Fatal Attraction series with Excalibur number 71. And it starts off hot. You got Spore taking it to Nightcrawler, hanging him from a cliff, pretty much telling him that he's not putting up much of a fight, that the flash scanners, that's what mutants called humans back in the day, put up more of a fight and they were in comas. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we covered it in X Factor number 92. But unfortunately, Spore forgot that Nightcrawler has a tail, he uses his tail, wraps it around his neck, pulls him back, starts putting them paws on him. Again, to the point to where now all of a sudden he's picked up a rock and he's about to kill him. He's even saying to himself, why do I want to kill this dude? And then he turns to the next page so it looked like he took him out. But then we see Rachel Summers and Kitty Pryde show up and Rachel Summers has the power of the Phoenix Force so she turns the rock into something harmless so that Nightcrawler doesn't kill him. And then Kitty has to remind Nightcrawler that Spore's mutant power is to admit a psychotic episode. That's why he wanted to kill him. So they detain him and they take him to Dr. Myra McTaggart. Now, if coming in from John the Hickman's X-Men, this is not the same Myra McTaggart. She's not a mutant. She's just a normal human. And actually, Professor Xavier and Myra had a thing going on for a while in the 90s. So then out of nowhere, Professor Xavier, Jean, and Scott show up. And for all you 90s X-Men fans who used to watch the cartoon, they borrowed heavily off of this air, as you can see. <laughs> So they're there because they want to use Kitty as bait because they know Kitty and Colossus has a thing going on and they want to try to help Colossus and turn him back to the X-Men and Kitty don't want nothing to do with it. So when you hear that Professor Xavier command asshole sometimes, this is one of those moments. He starts to talk to Kitty using his mental abilities and he's pretty much telling her to stop acting like a child. And Kitty's pretty much like, that's just it, I'm not a child no more. I'm gonna help you, but you can't make me like what I'm doing right now. So then it cuts to Avalon and the Acolytes. And you see Kitty on the screen talking to Colossus and she's like, you know, she sees the air of her ways and she wants to join the Acolytes and she wants a Colossus to come pick her up. And Exorcist is right there. And he's like, it's a trap. And Colossus is like, no, uh, Kitty wouldn't do that to me. You know, I don't trust the other X-Men, but I trust her. And Exodus again is like, it's a trap. And Klaus is like, no, it's not. He's like, look, I'm gonna let you go down there. I'm gonna let you know it's a trap. And whether you come back dead or alive, you coming back. So the transmission ends and Katie goes to turn around and Cyclops goes to say something to her. And she's like, this is why I left the X-Men in the first place. I don't want nothing to do with any one of y'all. And then she just walks away. Uh, Phoenix catches up to her, tries to console her and everything else. But now we're to the part of the story that I just could not believe. When you turn the page, you see it's Cable. For those of you guys that have been keeping up with the whole series, you know what happened at X-Force 25. Like, how is he fine? I mean, he goes up to Avalon, he fights Magneto, 
and he's fighting the master of magnetism. He is half metal. So you know how this is going to turn out. I mean, he had to know. Once Magneto said, you know what? I'm tired of you. Cable had to be like, not like this, <laughs> not like this. Magneto turned this man inside out. Even he was shocked when Cable was actually able to utter a word. And then <laughs> when Cable transported himself to the ship where the rest of the X-Force is at, somebody on that ship was like, what? <laughs> I mean, man was done. So to see him three books later looking a-okay and fine, I call bull. I don't care what kind of future it's a tech he got. That dude was done. Done, done, done. Like, even if he didn't die, he should not be the same. Plain and simple. So, getting back on track, the reason why Cable is getting all geared up is because he's been listening in on what's going on with the X-Men, and he doesn't want them to bring back Colossus into the fold. He feels like Colossus made his decision, and he needs to live with it. He is now the enemy, and Cable is going there to do something about it. So then it turns the page, and Nightcrawler is talking to Cyclops, and Cyclops is, you know, asking about, you know, how's the team going? And Nightcrawler's like, well, you know, this member's doing this, this member's doing that, and they show all the team members explaining what they're all doing. Pretty much, this is their way of getting rid of the old team and starting the new team fresh, led by Nightcrawler phoenix and kitty pry so here's a cool moment between mother and daughter sort of rachel sit there and she's watching the waves and then gene walks up now rachel is from the days of future past timeline you know she was there that's a dystopian future it's one of the most famous x-men stories of them all so i'm probably not telling you guys anything you already don't know um, but anyway, plus, you know, they made a horrible movie about it. The movie was so bad. So Jean comes out and says that she was hesitant to talk to Rachel because she didn't know how to approach her. Obviously, she's not a mother yet, so she doesn't know how to kind of give motherly advice. But she does tell, tell Rachel that uh, her and Cyclops are actually working on trying to have her. God, that sounds weird, don't it? But anyway, they're having this cool mother-daughter moment. And then Professor Xavier interrupts him and was like, hey, Colossus is coming. You guys got to get to your places. So Colossus shows up and he starts talking to Kitty. So then on the next page, you see Cable climbing the cliff and then Rachel comes out of nowhere and ambushes him. So this is a fight between brother and sister, except for they don't know it. Cable is from the timeline where Apocalypse rules the world. Rachel is from the Days of Future Past timeline where the Sentinels rule the world. Now they are the exact opposite of Tupac and his sister. And even though we had different daddies. Daddy's the one thing that's have in common, which is Cyclops. Cable is Madeline Pryor's kid. So technically, Jean didn't have Cable. And also she did because Madeline Pryor is an exact clone. I mean, exact. So take how you want it. So while that's going on, Kitty's talking to Colossus. And then lo and behold, it's a trap, just like Exodus said. And yet and still, he gets ambushed, he gets frozen in place, and he has a look on his face looking at Kitty of like surprise and also a little bit of hurt too. Then it cuts back to Rachel and Cable and they are going at it. I mean, tooth to nail. Long story short, uh, Cable gets distracted because Rachel like turned into something and she used her Phoenix powers to knock out Cable. And now she can hear Cable's AI, which only he should be able to hear, but she can hear too. And she goes to talk to AI and she's asking AI like, why am I so drawn to this dude? And the AI kind of knows, but the AI doesn't want to really tell Rachel this because I don't think he feels like she can process all that. So I'm not going to lie, this comic book gets kind of boring after this point. So I'm just going to kind of zip through it. They pretty much capture Colossus. They use a ray to get through his metal exterior and he changes back into a normal human. And pretty much he explains exactly what we already know. The reason why he joined 
the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, or I'm sorry, it's not the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, the Acolytes, is because he still hurt that Eliana, his little sister, was one of the first victims of the legacy virus and he didn't know how to accept that. So pretty much all that muss and fuss that they just went through, Colossus still goes back with the Acolytes because he feels like with him there, he could make a difference with them and possibly get them to start acting more like the X-Men instead of what they have been acting like. And that's pretty much how the book ends. Very uneventful, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I love this series, but it ended on kind of a bad note, especially at the end of this comic book. But please tell me what you guys think, whether you have read the series in the past or whether you're one of the few people to actually watch all the videos of the series. Let me know in the comments how you like it. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Uh, you know, what was your favorite part? I want to know all the things. Please, all the things. In saying that, if you are new here to SEM, please hit that subscribe button and become part of this SEM Nation. Just become part of this thing so you hit that bell notification, you know, when a new video comes out. And if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. My name is Dorian. This is SEM Comics. Thank you guys for watching my videos. I really do appreciate it. And you guys have a good day.